Hello, and welcome to another Ditch Witch Diaries. This time we are talking about tarot and the magician. So let's get going. Tarot, the magician. Here we go, folks. Let's get going. Because the origins and evolution of the magician are so interesting and, again, add so much insight. So I hope you're, you like it as much as I do. So the first kind of two images where we really get the Trump's version of the magician, we go to the Italian Bagato, who is like a stage magician, and the French Batelure, right? And the Batelure is a sleight of hand artist, okay? So the earliest of imagery we really get it's not like the best, it's not the magician that we want to think of, right? We get this image of kind of like a carnival barker or a street performer. It's definitely somebody who's a huckster. It's like somebody who like plays the game of the cups game, trying to kind of connive you out of the money. That's kind of the idea behind the magician card at this point. The earliest cards show the magician or the bagato or the bachelor in an indoor setting and he's entertaining with kind of like this sleight of hand or it but really it's a gambling game it's a game of chance so like I said it's much more like that game of cups where people kind of bet where it is and it's kind of more like that type of sleight of hand. Although these words actually translate directly into conjurer it's still this guy is viewed as kind of a, a wanderer of ill repute, so a vagabond, whatever. And around 1650 in the Tarot de Marseille, we see this imagery. Um, and it's not until the 1800s that we really get into the golden dawn and the... I. I the golden dawn will alter this swaggy into a position of power as a magician. So I love that. And that's what it's going to take because up until then, this it's a completely different person than who we later end up with because of the golden dawn. So let's just look at some of these pictures, right? There's, I love looking at these pictures and I hope you just get a kick out of them too. So we get some of these earlier pictures and I'm just going to enjoy them a little, but we see indoor setting and there's some sort of sleight of hand going on. That's outdoors, but still much more closer to what we have now, I would say. There we go. Outdoors as well. I don't know where they get that indoor setting thing because now we're like seeing some outdoor imagery here, but still it's much more like this game of chance that we get. There's probably indoor. And also there's some of like, because this is an imagery of a sh shoe repairman or somebody who's working at their craft. So that's an interesting kind of switch from things. And there's another one. So, okay. So then we transition and like the next kind of layer to this puzzle of the magician. We looked at the old older imagery and what that meant and kind of the older um ideas behind the imagery and then we transition and layer on this idea of numerology so what is in a number one and we will see this repeated over and over again so we will just be revisiting these numbers over and over again throughout the tarot and they will repeat some of the same meaning right so number one is going to be always a um, number of innovation. It's this spark of genius. It's like the one, right? It's something that you can't even, it's that spark of something that makes it, makes all the difference in the world. Um, it's using the old ways and kind of transforming them into a miracle, really. It's alchemy. It's like I said, it's it's taking the old and making something new altogether. One is also about confidence. It's also about you. Like numero uno, I'm number one. Trusting in yourself, trusting at the tools at your disposal. 
you have everything you need for this alchemy. So as we see with the magician, but really one is all about that trust and confidence in yourself. Also, one often implies a singleness of purpose or a single goal, a oneness, a unification of heart or purpose, um, a concentration on that one thing, this one journey, right? Um, it's also one, though, is also not a stagnant number because there are numbers that imply stability and kind of a little bit of stagnation, right? This one, though, this implies um, action and using opportunity. I even think of um, like the first uh, astrological sign, Aries, as such an action sign. Or like, you know, there, like one is such a, um, a, like, we're just starting this, like jump, like think of it like when the, um, when the, when the per when you're getting ready for a race and you're up in those blocks, well, you're you would be because I certainly would not be in racing blocks. But I'm like giving my audience a lot. Hopefully, y'all can know what being in racing blocks is. What one is is right at that firing when you take off. That's one. It's action. It's using opportunity. It's okay. So what happened is that like you just had stepped off the cliff with the fool, right? And um, you're just, you're in the journey. You're in the action. Even though both, as I itch myself, even though both um, one, even though both the fool and this card are a little bit um, outside of time and space, as we're going to see, um, you are in the action. And this is a, one is a number of will because it is something that it's like a like I said this whole thing singleness of purpose confidence will it all kind of yeah independence of course it's not dependence it's not two it's not forming a unity it's one it's making your own luck it's a solitary number you're on stage right just you and it's like this outer sense of self. So also in astrology, um, one is like your rising sign, right? So that like first house. So that is, it's you, but it's like who everybody sees of you. So that's one. Okay. Whew. So magical correspondences. So I love that image of the magician, our magician. And in the Arabic number is one, the Roman number, that would be an I in my um, font today. <laughs> Sometimes they give better Roman numerals than other days. Um, so then the rom romance titles are Les Jongleurs. And as everybody's well aware, I murder every word I speak that isn't twangy English. So I do my best, though. If nothing else, I try, right? So Il Bagat. Le Bagad, Le Batelur, Il Bagatino, Il Bagato, Il Batel, Il Siabatino. So, or Chab Chabatino, Chabatino? Yeah, Chabatino. Wow, I think I really did get that one. The Hermetic title, and this is what this image represents, is the Magus of Power. So, this is the Magus of Power. The planet is Mercury. The Hebrew letter is Beth. And the English equivalent is B. So the animals that are associated, and we're going to see this in some of the cards that we're going to look at later. So get ready, like especially the baboon or the monkey, the ibis, the coyote, the fox, the greyhound, the hare, the weasel, the ape, the nightingale, the thrush, the lark, the parrot, the mullet, and the jackal. The plants, and we got a lot of them here. So, you know, like when we get a lot of plants, I would rather have less than more, but it's an interesting thing. I can, you can almost, I, I like to go through and make arguments with these plants. Almond, aspen, astragalus, bamboo, caraway, cinquefoil, clover, coriander, dill, elecampane, fennel, fenugreek, whorehound, laurel, lavender, licorice, lily of the valley, majorum, mint, papyrus, parsley, rose, skullcap, vervain, and wildflowers. 
The incense you could use is bayberries, cinnamon, citrus, gum mastic, mace, nutmeg, nutmeg, odorous seeds, white sandalwood, and storax. It'll be sad if you get red sandalwood and think it's going to smell like sandalwood. Just saying. <laughs> it's it can be used as a dye but it's not it doesn't smell like white sandalwood it doesn't smell like sandalwood what you think rock and metal associated with the magician is agate coral emerald glass gems that aren't real gems that's probably hearkening back right to that whole the older kind of view of what who this is right marcasite metals and marcasite again is that other one it makes like a a not so precious gem, like really precious metals um, as coins. So when they're struck into coins, so that's also is the coin in the picture in this card, but also um, it's the idea that you're making, you are taking um, power from heaven ostensibly or from the universe and bringing it down to earth and making it into a coin metals in that are mixed together mixed color metals opal quartz and quicksilver the color is yellow still um you'll see that again so look there we have it rider Waite smith symbology and this is our magician see how it's transformed from our others we got you all ready for it and here it is so let's go through these symbols here so the yellow sky is all about clarity, openness, nothing is hidden, right? There's not a cloud in the sky. So this is about openness. We still get that sense of it's about you, it's about self. This is your journey. Then we get the idea. So we're going to look at both the rose and the lily, but we're going to piece this apart first. So you see the rose on top and the rose on the bottom. So the rose on the top and the bottom is a symbol of life. So it's about merging. It's about betrothal. It's about all things like upper chakra, divine feminine. And then we also, though, have this thing that you're taking things above and things below and making magic because it's also um, the lily is only on the bottom. And the lily is a symbol of death. So again, we're, we see this imagery about being in the middle between life and death. We've seen this before with the fool and still the magician lives in this place. We are, we see um, right in the middle between the rose and the, um, and the lily. So together, um, the, the, we get what's going on is that this ma magician is re resol resolving disharmony, creating things and dissolving things it's the abundance of life and death manifestation taking things from the above and transmitting them into real life into earthly things right so again the right hand is up and is like as above so it reads that it's like the right hand represents your highest self too so what's your highest self so in parts work it's that part of yourself that is, what is it? It's connected, it's creative, courageous, and I'm doing it through my chakras. So let me tell you the chakras. So the root chakra is connected. The solar, the sacral chakra is um, creative or creativity. The um, solar plexus chakra is um, courageous. Heart chakra, compassionate. Throat chakra, um, confident. Um, third eye is curious and having curiosity and clarity. And then your crown chakra is um, calm. So uh, what your higher shock, your highest self is all of those things. And that's what your right hand and that reaching up represents. And it's like saying as above, it's that as above symbol. It's your highest self, okay? And it holds a wand, which is double-ended. So for the magician's world, this energy travels both ways, okay? So he's transmitting energy from our world to the heavens and from the heavens to our world. So it, it's a, also white, which we know already is a sign of purity, 
the suits and the elements are on the table. And because the suits and the elements and make up the minor arcana, okay? These are the, excuse me, the coin, which is pentacles and the cup and the swords and the wands. And they're sitting on the table. And this makes up the minor arcana. And the minor arcana, we're getting away from, see, the major arcana is very an archetypal type of thing. And it's often looked at as a journey, this ar archetypal journey through the major arcana where the um and huge things in your life usually we're talking about huge patterns of your life right where the minor arcana we're talking about things that are happening today in this world almost always it's like not maybe not immediate but it's in this world on the table so the suits are on the table Okay, the cards are on the table, so, so to speak. The materials, you have the materials that you're working with. That's what you are working with, is this real life. You are the magician of real life. Then we see this infinity. What is it? A lamiscinate? Lemis, lem, I forgot. Oh my God, I don't know what that's, it is. But the, it's the infinity symbol which is of course unlimited potential and what it's like you are the creator of this open portal of infinite potential that is happening right now you have the tools and the and what the tool and the material is life is your life so this this is great. I don't know. Oh gosh, that word's going to kill me. This infinity symbol. And of course I did not write it down because if I could write it down, I would have read it. I would have been able to read it. Anyway, it, it did in, um, in other, in older decks, this was the hat. Remember the brim of the hat was an infinity symbol as well. So it also tells us a little bit that, like I said, like that zero in, um, the fool, this the magician is operating kind of in an un, in a realm outside of time and space, a time of infinity where there, the possibilities are still endless. We're still in this um, archetypal kind of place, right? So then, but the the magician is wearing a red robe, and this is like the red roses. It's like life. It's a symbol of passion and power and lifeblood, just like the roses. It harkens to the roses. And like it is like bringing your very lifeblood into this alchemical stance. That's what this, um, this magician is doing. Um, and by the way, you can look, he's still wearing that homespun garment from the, um, that the, presumably that the fool was wearing as well. Presumably it's the same garment. So. Um, white tunic. There you go. Is it the same homespun tunic as in the fool? And if you did go and look up he, then you would be very interested in a possible homespun garment and what that might mean. And especially then the, the anyway, there's, it would take on a lot of other symbolism as well. So now we look at the Ouroboros, which is the belt around his very body. It, it encircles his very like torso, the very center of the magician. Um, and this is about renewal and reinvention. Um, and you, it's about unity and an eternal cycle, of course, because it's the um, snake that's eating its tail is what this is image, the image of, so. And then we get, we have the finger upward, right? And then we have the finger downward as well. So it's, it's this thing of the how of his alchemy. So if the right hand is like, this is as above, so below. It's how do we do it? It's in real life. This is like, we are doing, we are putting it in the ground. We are taking all this amazing power and we are pointing to a specific place in the universe and a specific thing that is happening. So again, we talked about the table a little bit, but we can, we return to it. Like the cards, so to speak, are on the table. This is where the magic happens. Now is the time and here is the place. So this is the magician for you. It's a pretty interesting card. But there are some other um, kind of embedded archetypal yummies that we kind of need to like pick and pull at. 
So we need to kind of harken back to what they harken back to is this older symbolism that we saw in these cards. So we kind of have to reckon with that, I think, a little bit, don't we? I mean, I'd like to reckon with it, wouldn't you? So let's do it. So the professional, right? That magician, the original magician was a professional. He was out like a, a, a huckster maybe, but a professional. The magician is adept at engaging his audience. He symbolizes skill, dexterity, the ability to manipulate reality through illusion. So a bit of that manipulation of how, what people see, um, a little bit of turning the like the universal flow into real life. So then we also have to reckon with this trickster motif. But I will tell you, I really kind of like it a little bit better here than the fool place. So we did have to look at the fool as trickster, but the, I think the trickster maybe has a dual symbolism as both the fool and kind of this magician, right? This really intentional magician. Um, the trickster implies will and possibly not so innocent will, um, possibly not an innocent will. Where the fool plays jokes like April Fool, the trickster aspect of the magician, it's a little bit more cunning, a little bit more deceptive, right? It's, it's about being able to outsmart people in the public, in front of people. Um, this side of this card represents the use of cleverness and guile to achieve your goals, often through unconventional or deceptive means. I would like to take your own means, maybe. Um, just you trust your own means. The, the world's means may not be yours. You can operate in a different space here, right? So also the magician as a creator, because he is doing something. He is using this. He's obviously creating something and doing something. He's the master of the elements. He's using his tools that are representing the four suits of the tarot. And he creates and transforms. So when you look at it in this aspect, you're really looking about this intentionality and this intention of will and the ability to channel energy into very tangible results um, along your journey. So young and the tarot. So I want to talk about this because I feel like I just flew into this a little bit before and I, I kind of maybe need to break this up a little bit. So here we go. So we can talk about it more later. First of all, young didn't say much about the tarot per se. Okay. Maybe a little bit here and there, but it, the stuff he said too, wasn't altogether accurate. So like he made some, well, anyway, I don't want to get into it because he just didn't know a lot about the tarot. That's what it was clear. But Jung believed that symbols and archetypes are have like un, some sort of universal power and that there's these reoccurring images and themes that they take from something called our collective unconscious. Um, these archetypes, we see them in myths in stories and dreams from across cultures. I mean, I look at the stories of herbs from across cross cultures, and sometimes we do see these mythologies appear over and over again. Like um, fairies do have a very interesting um, place, whether you're in, um, whether you're talking about the story about cannabis, when I think it's from China, where the fairies lured a man Seven, like um for years into the fairy realm and when he came out he dissolved into dust that would that fairy motif wouldn't it wouldn't upset me if that story were taking place in ireland or anywhere else because fairies kind of have that place in our collective unconscious right that's kind of the idea okay sometimes it works out neatly sometimes it doesn't work out so neatly but we're going to let it work out neatly. This is what Young thought, right? And there, and a lot of times they do. A lot, you know what? A lot more often than not. I, I'm not a full-on Jungian. Um, I, I think Young is more of a, the way his philosophies and his ideas of looking at things are more of a tool rather than a, um, a strict doctrine. Okay. So he also talked about archetypes. So that's what these 
major arcana really are. And archetypes are, quote, forms or images which occur all over the earth as constituents of myths and at the same time as auto thonus individual products of the unconscious original. That was a lot of blah, 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 but I think it's interesting. So it's like we produce original material on our own and we also are part, it all goes in together into this universal whole, which, okay. And out it comes, archetypes that really are meaningful across large dimensions. Like I said, sometimes these work, sometimes they don't. So we're, we're saying that they work really well with tarot, right? <laughs> For me, they do. Um, so then sequencing. So then I talked a lot about Jungian sequencing before. And again, the reason why I said this is not because Jung had a specific tarot sequence that he liked, but because he believed in like this path towards individuation. And authors have taken a lot of Jung's ideas and massage them into this tarot journey in the major arcana i mean there's some notable let me see if i can just reach in and pull out one of my notables of course let me just pull out a book here this one there's one so that's a good one that's one that i use that's young in the archetypal journey right so there's things like that that's an idea of a book the but what he says, though, about individuation is that this process is about confronting and integ integrating various aspects of the psyche and moving through stages of development that reflect dualities and opposites that Jung described. And, of course, synchronicity, which is a little like pulling cards and how things just magically all work out and line up and it's when to where the magic is right and he talked about it so now let's pull back around and talk about Jung and sequence and the magician so the well and I've got these bolded letters so you guys can kind of see what's going on here so the magician is the initiator of individuation this process that Jung talked about right this path towards wholeness or self or like um being like the person who say the saves the kingdom right the hero the hero's journey okay so they guide this whole journey that leads to the darkest depths and counterintuitively to our highest self so that's where they symbolize, the magician symbolizes the direct energy and humanizing universal flow. So what does that mean? That he's real, the magician, and whether a man or a woman, because I showed a, a woman imagery here, feminine or um, non-gendered, maybe a non-binary magician. I, I prefer actually a non-binary imagery. That would work for me. Um, but he, really what the magician, no matter what gender, is that it humanizes universal flow. So universal, it takes the flow of the universe and really brings it into our reality. It takes that upper and points to the ground and the lower. They thrust you into personal and universal flow. The magician represents the magical aspect of us. They are the magical part of us. They live beyond space, time, matter, soul, or spirit. They give us the basis for this journey. So this is about, this whole journey is about bending energy, organizing it, alchemical creation, and what it is, the alchemy of, what are you creating of self? It's the, to young, this is the alchemy of self. So what you have what do you have to do to go forward in this journey you have to free yourself enough and you've done it already to step off the pledge in the in the fool and where do you step to you step into the magician who is transformer of both the inner and the outer worlds you trusted in the universal flow and it was like it like you can see like think imagine like the 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 fool stepping off the cliff and being sucked right into the wand like and down into the magician's stance now you're the transformer of both inner and outer worlds so i love this the magician's state of being and what the magician like works with is synchronicity 
the seeming coincidences between external and internal events. One thing that's interesting about, though, the, the um, magician, though, is that it seems to be that the magician is called in response to a need. And often even that happens all over the place in all sorts of journeys. Joseph Campbell's hero journey, um, Jung's um, journeys, they it starts with this call, this need. Um, and it's a response to a need that's involved in magic. It calls us to analyze what our mind and body and soul need. That's what this car, card asks us. What do we need that's propelling us forward on this path to individuation, to universal flow so that we can be in universal flow and enjoy this time beyond space and this, the, this space beyond time and space or whatever. So now let's look at my fools because we can learn a lot from looking at, I've got a lot of different fools here. So now that we talked a lot, we can look at them. So look at this one and look, look who's there. Look who showed up in this fool card. This is the Tarot of the New Vision. So the Tarot of the New Vision is looking at the backwards, uh, like from the back looking. And I, these are, they're just so, um, what's the word for it? Like um, interesting, just an interesting viewpoint. But we see the the monkey there, right? Remember that was like a, a, a um, the animal. And then the herb crafter's tarot is sunflower. So perfect. One stalk, solitary, shoots up. That's it. One. So good. I love that. Um, modern witch's tarot. And this is the modern witch's tarot. Pretty close to um, pretty close to the imagery of the Rider Waite Smith tarot. Um, we lose some of the the flower imagery, which kind of is it to me important um to really get the imagery of the lily and the rose because it's about life, life, blood, life, and death being at the center of this life and death thing. And that's usually the need. It's like life and death. What is this journey? What is the hero's journey? What is like all this? It's like life and death, this call to like this path of individuation, right? So then here's the spellcaster's tarot, very an interesting kind of uh, view of things, I would say, certainly. And this is the one that I use all the time, the Hanson Roberts tarot, and um, <laughs> a little chesty, if I might say so. Some of the images on these I like a lot more than others, I'll say, but they do keep a lot of the general imagery. Although they, again, they lose the homespun garment, which I like the homespun garment. They replace it with a blue garment, which maybe, perhaps, they keep a lot of the same ones. So how do we put all this together? How do we make this all work together? So again, how we make this work is that this, the magician is the next step after the fool steps off the cliff. You have to learn this energy of alchemy. It's in, this is the first step in you individuating and channeling energy and learning to channel energy is magical alchemy for the magician. So we put on this magician's hat. That's what it all means is that you, when you pick this card, you're putting on the magician's hat, the, the infinity, right? You're, you're being called to step into a place of, you know, out of this universe, out of time and space and really tr learn about tr channeling energy and universal flow and channeling an er energy from, um, it, it actually can go both ways. So for this magician, but it's really you know, the making of universal energy into real earthly things and the back and forth of that. This is the place of the magic building of the suits. This is where they're infused with the upper energies to act on us, in us and through us. This is where this all happens. You're making the magic of the future of these suits in this car. It's an... It's like you're making the magic like of all like the suits. You're taking like this above and making it like as above, so below. It's here that we learn as above, so below that will change everything. This changes everything. This learning how to channel energy, the stepping into universal flow and stepping into magical space. It's um, 
being able to transmit the um, ethereal into the concrete. There is action and will that is required though. So when you get this, it's not, it's not a card of being sedate and sedentary or thinking it over. This is action and will required. And it's likely your other people, you're going to be on stage. Other people are going to be watching it. So there is an implication of real world action in this card. Even though it's a card where you'll be kind of out of time and space, you'll be operating in the space between time and space. You, um, this is real world action. You are transmitting that energy into the real world with the suits, the cards on the table, the finger pointing to the ground, so many things. So then let's look at the reverse here. Okay, when you get this reverse, and remember, I'm going to be analyzing this the way I do, but I think it kind of makes sense in the way that most people look at the reverses, but it's just the way I go about it. And remember, I look at reverses like it's not happening in the real world. It's only happening inside us and not in the real world. So if I got a reverse magician i would say that this isn't about magic in actual outward action at all in fact this is only about magic inside you it's about taking internal action so doing the work inside you perhaps all the magic is internal so what are things that you need to decide or commit to in your head that may or may not have real life counterparts? You just need to make a decision or you need to come to something. What energy from above do you need to pull down to create change inside yourself, not necessarily outside yourself? In fact, not outside yourself, not in the real world. So alternatively, Perhaps, okay, so another way of another way you could possibly see this if it's not in the real world, perhaps the magic really, it's supposed to be in the real world. Perhaps things are so stuck inside your head that they're not making magic at all. All the magic is happening inside you and then there's, there's some block to getting it out. Like whether you need this magic inside or not, that's gonna depend on the rest of the cards and the reading, whether this is a positive or a negative, right? Because if it's impacted negatively around it, you would say, you would, you would not say, oh, you need to make magic inside yourself. You would say that something inside yourself is making it so the magic can't get out. Like it's stuck inside yourself and it's not on the outside. So search yourself and what's that plug in the drain? Why is not magic flowing down into real life? So those are two, and you can see how those, if even, even if you looked at it, like um, it's happening inside yourself and not in real life, you can see how that's, it, it probably is very close to how people would read a reverse card of the magician. So then I also, for an added bonus, because I forgot this and I promised it, but I made you wait all the way to the end. <laughs> okay, so the Fool reversed. So let's look at the Fool reversed. So remember last week what the Fool was? It was taking a step off that cliff. It was trusting in universal flow. It was... um. Um, like looking up and not looking at the ground. It was like the transmission of, of sun energy from that plume that we also saw in the sun and death. It was like the, the white rose that we also saw mirrored in the death card, all those things, right? So then we reverse it. So what that means is that all that energy is happening inside us and not outside us. So what does that mean? It's that you're, you're jumping off a cliff inside your heart. This isn't like you're jumping off like a journey in like a whole journey aspect. You are jumping off an internal journey and not in real life. Like this is not a thing that's happening in your entire arc. This is an internal arc. So you're embarking on a completely new journey in your headspace. Get ready because by the end of this thing, you may look back and wonder how you ever like thought the way you thought or did the things you did. Um, don't even think that there's going to be external in the world adventure or change. Okay, this is only in your head and your heart. In fact, there may be a pull of sameness in your world. Okay, so 
you may feel like, oh, everything's just the same. And um, don't let that seeming like external lack of movement deter you. Like, don't let that feeling of, oh, like, dang it, like, I'm just nothing's happening. Don't like you will feel that feeling. And don't let that deter you because what that focus, that restlessness inside, you need this time of external stability where nothing is really changing on the outside so that you can completely accomplish the big feat that is about to happen inside. Now is not the time to move. Now is not the time to do anything in the external world. It's the time of stepping off a cliff inside your heart. There you go. So these are the sources that I use this time. And you can take a snapshot if you'd like to get all those books. Lots of books. I love my books. There you go, folks. Let's see here. Let me stop my share. That was so much fun. Yay! I cannot wait to see you at the next Ditch Witch Diaries and the next Tarot. Hi, Priestess. <laughs> Oh, I love the high priestess. I will see you at the next Ditch Witch Diaries.